Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 3rd of September, 2018, the 23rd of Elul, 5778. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Land of Israel Network. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston, and on Twitter, at Josh Haston. We have a great show for you here today. A very special guest is on the line right now, Dr. Anat Wilf. He's a leading intellectual and thinker on matters of foreign policy, economics, education, and Israel and the Jewish people. He's also a former member of Knesset with both the Labor and Independence Parties. Uh, She's also a well-respected author. Her new book is called Telling Our Story, Recent Essays on Zionism, the Middle East, and the Path to Peace. Dr. Wolf, thanks so much. It's an honor to have you here on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. I have been following your Twitter account uh, over the last couple of weeks. You've been extremely busy. Uh, The U.S. State Department over the weekend released a statement, and you've been commenting on it. Uh, The administration, it says here in the statement, has carefully reviewed the issue and determined that the U.S. will not make additional contributions to UNRWA. That's the U.N. Relief and Works Agency for the those Arabs, uh, the Arab refugees here in the Near East, those who left Israel in 1948. What is your reaction, first of all, to the U.S. administration's new policy that it will not contribute any more funds to UNRWA? This is an incredibly important beginning to a path that could ultimately lead us to peace because no American administration has ever dared touch the core issue of the conflict. And this is the core issue of the conflict. It's not about the territory, the settlement, the borders, the occupation, and not even Jerusalem. The core issue is what the Palestinians call the right of return, but there is actually no such right. But it is their demand, which is in effect was created and conceived at the end of the war in 1949, as a continuation of the war by other means. The idea was that basically the Arabs have failed in preventing Jewish immigration in the previous half century. They failed in preventing partition at the UN General Assembly, and they were defeated in the war to prevent partition and the birth of the state of Israel. But from their perspective, all these defeats were not the end of the story as far as they were concerned, the war, the war against Zionism was not over. And one of the main issues, the main means in which to project the idea that the war is not over was to keep the Arab refugees, those who fled as a result of the war, in an infinite situation of limbo where they continue to be registered as refugees by this organization called UNRWA, in the expectation that one day Israel will disappear and they can so-called take back uh, Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, The United States has been the number one funder of this organization for over 70 years, thinking that even if it doesn't do too much good, it can't do too much harm, which was a terrible mistake. It has been I would argue the number one harmful organization because this is the organization that has kept alive for the Palestinians the idea that Israel and Zionism is temporary. And worse, it has led them to believe that they are not alone in their demand that Israel be undone. It's one thing to want it, you know, everyone wants things. It's a completely different thing to think that the world is with you in that uh, want, in that demand. And this is what UNRWA and America paying for UNRWA did. And in America ceasing to pay for UNRWA, it's actually sending the message of enough is enough. So I agree completely. I think this is the right step by the U.S. administration at this juncture and um i I agree with you completely that they are just perpetuating the conflict they have been doing this for 70 years unra but i read the other day and this is what disturbs me i read uh, unnamed high-ranking idf officials saying that defunding unra is a mistake it will cause unrest and again they're not really revealing their names here so i can't tell you exactly who said it 
And I, you know, almost fell over my in my chair there that this actually came from IDF, top-ranked IDF officials, supposedly. What is your reaction to Israel, or at least some officials in Israel, saying that the U.S. erred in defunding UNRWA? So this is a long-standing policy of the defense establishment. It was a policy established essentially in 1967, immediately after the Six-Day War, which was the first time that Israel came to control territories where UNRWA operated in the West Bank and Gaza before 67. Uh, these were outside Israel borders. Uh, and, the, and the view at the time was, who knows what the future of the territories will be. If in the meantime, we have an organization that provides schooling and health care, let it be. And this let it be view continued for 50 years. Uh, governments of the right, government of the left, it is a constant. And the view of the defense establishment was one really of inertia that says, let's not touch it. The people go to school, they get health care. Let's not touch it. Not only did they not say not touch it, they actively prevented any effort by members of Congress at the time under Harper it was the Canadian government to defund the organization. For decades, Israel has been the number one lobbyist for UNRWA, as crazy as it sounds. It is. It does and sound crazy to me. Yes, and it is. It does come from inertia. And the book that I wrote with Adi Schwartz uh, in Hebrew, it's called The War for Return. Uh, the reason we wrote it in Hebrew is we wanted to open for public criticism in Israel this position of the defense establishment. And we wanted to say, look, maybe it buys us short time quiet. Even that's a question. But but it but but the price is long term conflict. So we need to discuss this price as a public, as citizens. And I think after 50 years, the time has come to say that the price we paid for the so-called long term quiet that UNRWA buys us has been way too high a price. And it's time to reverse it. And to realize that UNRWA's operations do not do good in the Middle East. They're not a moderating force. And in fact, they are the most radical force because they keep for a population which by now numbers 5.3 million, the idea that they should persist in their struggle, in their armed struggle against Israel because Israel is temporary. You recorded, uh, or I believe actually somebody recorded a video of you speaking on this subject recently, and you were explaining in the video why it makes zero sense for UNRWA, UNRWA to operate specifically in areas governed by the Palestinian Authority. You mentioned Ramallah. Explain this to the listeners, if you can, why it makes no sense for somebody who was born in Ramallah today to automatically fall under the auspices of UNRWA. So UNRWA has five areas of operation, Gaza, West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And we need to understand that in those areas of operation, the vast majority of those that UNRWA registers as refugees are not refugees by any international standard. In Jordan, there are 2.2 million, that's 40% of the total, who are citizens Nowhere in the world are citizens also allowed to be considered refugees. In the West Bank, they certainly by their accounting, and one might say by much of the world, they live in Palestine. So what you have is people living in Ramallah, it, by their accounting in Palestine, under the governance of the Palestinian Authority, and they are allowed to be registered as refugees by UNRWA. And it should be noted, 75% of those as registered as refugees by UNRWA in the West Bank don't even live in refugee camps. And even the word camps is wrong. It's by now neighborhoods that look like other neighborhoods. They don't live there. They are middle class lawyers living in Ramallah. Their parents were born in Ramallah. They were born in Ramallah. They were never displaced by war. And yet they are registered by an agency that has the words UN in it as refugees from Palestine. 
Now, a person who supports two states, such as myself, such as much of the diplomatic community, will say, well, what Palestine exactly are they refugees from if they were born in Ramallah and lived there in their entire lives? Well, for the Palestinians, the answer is clear. It's the Palestine from the river to the sea that will one day supersede Israel. But this is not something that the international community should condone and certainly not support diplomatically and financially. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, it's actually propaganda used by UNRWA and by uh, the Palestinian Authority, those calling for the so-called right of return when they mention camps. I mean, that automatically creates a, a, an image in your mind when talking people talk about refugee camps. It's extremely important that people understand what you said, that we're talking about, as you mentioned, middle class neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods. These aren't camps. Uh, they cannot be compared, God forbid, to you know any type of labor camps or even concentration camps. But that perception, unfortunately, uh, is in people's minds. What if uh, Arab countries step in for the U.S. and continue to fund UNRWA? I think they just carried out some kind of major fundraising drive. I mean, at the end of the day, with the U.S. pulling out their funding, if the Arabs step in, will they in fact be able to replace the U.S. as a serious funder? Or will UNRWA still be hurt, which deservingly so, as a result of uh, the U.S. Uh, pulling out their funding? So let me make a bet that the Arabs will not step in, because this is a core view of theirs, which is that UNRWA and the Arab refugees is not their business. In their view, they have already given too much. They have never uh -huh. given money. But in their view, the fact that they fought, the fact that, uh, you know, the, they are citizens of Jordan, they live in Syria, they live in Lebanon. As far as Arab countries are concerned, this is not their business. Um, it, an interesting anecdote is that when UNRWA was established, it was going to be called REWA, R-E-W-A. And yet the Arab countries insisted that the word, that the letters U-N, be in the name of the new agency because they wanted a clear message to be sent that they have nothing to do with this problem, that it is the UN that created Israel and the UN is responsible for the Arab refugees and it's not their business. They're innocent bystanders. The fact that they invaded, the fact that they um, opened war of annihilation, that's conveniently forgotten. So let me uh, bet that they're not going to step uh -huh. in. The issue is that we shouldn't leave this about questions of money. UNRWA tomorrow morning with the three quarters or two thirds of the budget could continue operating. It's a bloated organization and much of it is fake. So it can continue operating. The issue is not the money. The issue is that ultimately this organization should not exist. And we need to use this opportunity to basically engage in a global campaign that first demonstrates that there is no, there are no Palestinian refugees. There are at best 20, 30,000, which is a fraction of a percent of what, um, a fraction of a percent of what UNRWA registers. And we should also make it clear that there is no right of return, that it does not exist, that there is no such thing in international law. When there are refugees, within a few years, if the fighting is over and they can return home, that's wonderful. But if they can't, regardless of the reason, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the agency that deals with all the other refugees, it doesn't care who started, who's responsible, what's just. Within a few years, if refugees cannot return to their homes, it finds them other solutions which are considered equally legitimate. There's no question of right. There is no right of return. And even Resolution 194, which the Palestinians uphold, does not grant a right of return. And they conveniently forget that they also rejected the resolution at the time because they feared it meant recognizing Israel.
So there is no such thing as a right of return in any refugee situation and even not in the Palestinian situation. So we need to use the current step taken by the American administration to begin a global campaign to upend 70 years of Palestinian and Arab and Soviet propaganda to make it clear that there are barely no Arab, no Palestinian refugees and that there is no right of return. That is the narrative that has to become dominant. And I agree with you 100 percent. And people, when you put it into context here, just as an example, uh, Israel, when Israel was established in 1948, Israel took in all of the Jewish refugees, 800,000 plus from all of the neighboring Arab and Muslim countries who were thrown out. Israel took them in, resettled them, yet UNRWA continues to perpetuate this conflict, keeping these people as pawns on the front lines, uh, inciting against Israel in their textbooks. I mean, this is a, a horrible organization, and I agree with you completely. This organization, as you said, should not exist. Um, that we are nearly out of time, Dr. A. Not Wilf, but uh, I want you to be able to let the audience know how they can get a copy of your latest book, Telling Our Story, Recent Essays on Zionism, the Middle East, and the Path to Peace. How can people get a copy? So they can go to my website at wilf, W-I-L-F dot org, and download a free PDF copy, or they can, there's a link there for a Kindle version, or if they want to print on demand, it's on Amazon. And it really has much of what we talked about and many, many other essays that discuss Israel, Zionism, understanding the importance of properly telling our story, because I believe the path to peace comes from properly telling the story of Zionism and the region and the world properly understanding it. I want to thank you for your, ta your uh, time today and your amazing insight on the situation. And it's truly a pleasure to have you on the show. Dr. A. Not Wilf, former member of Knesset and a uh, leading intellectual and thinker here in Israel on many topics, specifically, uh, especially rather Israel and the Jewish people. I thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day. Shana Tova. All the best and keep up this important work on sharing the truth on UNRWA and all the other things here in Israel. Thanks so much. Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova. We are going to take a break right now. Josh Haston here. Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. You can get in touch with me during the week. Josh at thelandofisrael.com is my email. Thanks. Keep sending those emails on Facebook. It's Joshua Haston on Twitter at Josh Haston. Short break and be back with the news. Don't go anywhere. It's much more real than any reality show. It's much more dramatic than any drama. It's much more funny than any comedy. It's like a game show, but it's no game. It's our lives. Listen to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman, political correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, every week on thelandofisrael.com. And we are back, Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is the 3rd of September, 2018, the 23rd of Elul. Rosh Hashanah next week. I will not be on the air next week. I will be in the synagogue praying and praying and eating and doing a lot of fun stuff for the Jewish New Year. I'm here with my main man, Benjamin Bresky, engineer extraordinaire. Without him, there's no sound. Big thank you again to Dr. Anat Wilf. I don't know if you realize, you realize how brilliant she really is. And, you know, we don't agree on every topic, and that's okay. I don't believe, those, my, those listeners who know me, I don't believe in a two-state solution. Dr. Wolf said in the interview that she does, but that's her opinion. I have my opinion, um, but we do find common ground, especially on this UNRWA issue. And she said specifically that, the, uh, that this organization should not exist. She said it, she said it flat out, and UNRWA, again, just keeping people in limbo, keeping people as pawns um, for 70 plus years. You can go ahead and check out the press statement. Heather Newert, the department spokesperson at the U.S. Department of State, August 31st, 2018. Read how the U.S.'s 
decided that they have reviewed the issue, determined the U.S. will not make additional contributions to UNRWA. This is major, major news, and it's so disheartening when you have some random or unnamed senior IDF official who, and if you read Carolyn Glick's, Glick's column in the Friday J Post about the generals uh, in the IDF, unfortunately, again, not speaking about the whole IDF as a whole, and certainly not uh, uh, coming down on our soldiers who are protecting us 24-7, but read her column and understand, I guess, I would say that it's related in terms of that men mentality. We know this is the Middle East. We know you have to, you have to show strength. We know you, you have to be in, in negotiations and in business and in anything to do with everything going on here in the region. You have to be strong. And you have to stop this incitement from UNRWA. You have to take down that organization and their hate and, their, uh, and how they perpetuate the conflict. Get rid of UNRWA. I agree with Dr. Enot Wilf, not those unnamed sources. I'm sure many in the Israeli government are happy that uh, the U.S. is defunding them. And Israel needs to get on that bandwagon very soon. Uh, in Tekoa yesterday, switching gears, reported by Israel National News. And I heard some actually firsthand reports about this. A terrorist was throwing rocks at a car uh, near the Tekoa forest. Somehow he managed to infiltrate or somehow sneak into the community, picked up a metal or an iron bar, screaming Allah Akbar, and went on. Thank God it didn't succeed. Tried to go on a rampage. This happened as children were returning to school on September, yesterday, September uh, the 2nd. Um, the sirens went off in Tekoa in the middle of kids having their back-to-school ceremonies. It was on, uh, people were on lockdown in the neighborhood, and they caught the guy, uh, this terrorist uh, who had evil intentions. Thank God they uh, were alert, the security forces and others. And again, I heard firsthand accounts of people in Tekoa. Pretty frightening with so many kids out and about going to school that there was a, an attempted terror attack within the community. Speaking of terror, uh, the JTA reports that July saw a 15% rise in attacks in Israel based on information from the Shin Bet, Israel's uh, internal security service. The number of terrorist attacks here targeting Israelis in July increased by 15%. Uh, Israeli security services documented 255 attacks, including 11 in Jerusalem. This is actually JTA on the Times of Israel uh, website. In June, there were 220 incidents, so it's up a bit. In May, however, there were 365 incidents, document, documented incidents of terror. And I know just from living in Gush Etzion, it, it seems, and I know we've had different uh, periods like this in the past, it seems that the daily rock attacks and firebomb attacks have increased in the last several days, in the last week, really. I don't have those exact figures with rock attacks, but it just seems like these attempted lynches and rock attacks and attempted murder, that's really what it is, are on the rise. I mean, these numbers confirm that, but I just, just based on the number of reports that I get each and every day on these attacks, uh, something is, uh, something's going on. We have, we've been having for about a hundred years, peaks and valleys in terms of terror attacks. Unfortunately, last month it's up. And it seems uh, I don't have we don't have uh, the August numbers yet. It seems that um, those numbers will be up as well. So finishing on something uh, extremely wonderful and positive here in the state of Israel, 2.3 million Israeli kids are back in school as the school year begins. Um, it's amazing to see who would have thought just 70 years ago that you would have 2.3 million Israeli children here in the land of Israel going to school, receiving a Jewish education, learning about the history of Zionism, the beauty of the land of Israel, the beauty of the Jewish people and all of their customs and rituals and traditions, our customs and rituals and traditions, um, 2.3 million Israeli kids in school. I, I don't know even if 2,000 years ago, I don't think you would have this many Israeli kids running around the streets of Jerusalem and Haifa and Tel Aviv and Gush Etzion and everywhere else and going to school and receiving a Jewish education here in the Jewish state of Israel. So that's, let's end on that positive note. I want to wish all the listeners out there who celebrate Rosh Hashanah, a Shana Tova Umetuka, a happy and sweet new year for all of our listeners here in the Land of Israel Network. 
I want to extend that as well to all the other show hosts on the Land of Israel Network, Benjamin Bresky, Engineer Extraordinaire, everyone involved in this project we call the Land of Israel Network. So I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, hope I hope that everyone has a meaningful uh, Rosh Hashanah, and we will speak again uh, two days or a day and a half, rather, before Yom Kippur. Shana Tova from a beautiful, beautiful uh, Monday here in Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the state of Israel. And, uh, of course, most importantly, between now and when we speak again in two weeks from now, not next week, two weeks from now, everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from Jerusalem, Israel. The question is, why are the Jews there in the first place? The Jewish people have been yearning to return to their ancient homeland for a long time. It's the Yishai Fleischer Show, the voice of a new generation of pro-Israel activists. And there's only two kinds of minorities in the Middle East, armed or unarmed. Inspiring minds to think differently. That jihadism doesn't just attack Jews. It attacks Christians, and it mostly attacks Muslims. Inspiration, spirituality, and politics. So first and foremost, this country is here to defend Jewish people and to live in its ancestral homeland. Listen to the Yishai Fleischer Show every week on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.